Many years ago, Daniel Webster was one of America's best-known statesmen and orators. Dan when Daniel Webster spoke, the crowd sat in rapt attention. He was a political genius, understood politics, but he understood law and he understood statesmanship. One day after a state banquet, Daniel Webster was asked this question. What is the most serious thought that has ever passed across your mind? And Daniel Webster said this, the sense of my individual responsibility to God. He said, the most serious thing I've ever thought of in my life, the most significant thought that has ever passed through my mind was this sense of my responsibility to God. Then he went on to explain himself. He said, this thought is not pleasant to those who are living in their sins and out of relationship to him, and consequently are not prepared to face the tremendous issues involved. But whether the issues are faced or not, the fact remains. He continues, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We are all responsible to God, as the Word of God declares, and cannot escape our responsibility. Daniel Webster was right. Every single one of us one day will give account of himself to God. Whether we believe it or not, whether we understand it or not, makes little difference. God created us as free moral agents. He's given every one of us the power of choice. And ultimately, we'll be responsible for the choices that we make. Someone said, choices are the stuff that life is made of and our choices will determine our eternal destiny. From the time you were born, the Holy Spirit began working in your life to draw you out to the things of eternity. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11, the Bible says that God has placed eternity in their hearts. In John chapter 1, the Bible says that Christ is the light that lights every man and women that has ever come into the world. So from the time you were born, those tinges that you have in your heart, those inclinations that you have in your heart to do right, were placed there by God. Every right impulse is placed in our hearts by God. Every right desire is placed in our heart by God. God then not only places those desires in our hearts, but God arranges circumstances in our lives to draw us to Him. God reveals Himself to us in a variety of ways. He reveals His majesty in nature. He reveals His beauty in the sunrise, in a beautiful flower bed. God reveals Himself to us constantly, and His attempt is to draw us to Him. He reveals Himself most fully in the Word of God. It's there we learn of His grace. There we learn of His mercy. There we learn of His love. There we learn of His compassion. There we learn of His goodness. There we learn of His mighty power. But His goal is to draw us to Himself. But God will never make the choice for us. Choices are the stuff that indeed life is made of. God has created us with free will and we're responsible for the choices we make. A friend of mine tells this story. His father had just become a Christian, and his father had this terrible habit of chewing snuff. A big thing of snuff. I don't know how to do it because I never chewed snuff in my life, you see. But so his, his dad, you know, who would have this problem, and his dad would get up in the morning saying, God, I'm giving up my snuff, and he'd bit this big chaw of tobacco in his hand, and they lived out in the farm, and his father would walk out on the porch, and he'd take this big chew of snuff, and he'd throw it as far as he could among the corn stalks. And then my friend said, about noontime, he saw his dad walking up and down those corn stalks. <laughs> what do you think his dad was doing? What do you think he was doing? He was looking for the snuff, right? Now, here's my question to you. If you were God, would you let him find it? If you were God, would you let him find it? The same choice that the man had in the morning, he has that same choice in the afternoon. 
And God is not going to take away that freedom of choice. God's going to allow that freedom of choice. So you and I can kneel before God and confess our sins. But in the afternoon, we can go looking for them again. We can say, Jesus, I'm so sorry that I watched that on TV. But boy, the show's pretty good tomorrow night. I think I'll get another look at it, see. God, I'm so sorry that I indulged in that and, and just destroyed my body. But man, God, did it taste good when I did it. I think I'm doing it again, you see. So, so the sanctuary service is not only given to us by God so that our sins are forgiven. It's rather to reveal that the God who forgives our sin desires to cleanse us from sin. And God's great longing is that our will, our freedom to choose will be placed upon Him. And God's end-time judgment reveals that we're responsible for our actions. In the life that we live, many people say, oh, it's my genetics that caused me to do it. It's my environment that caused me to do it. It's my friends that caused me to do it. But the judgment reveals that God has done everything He could to save every human being and that ultimately we're responsible for our own choices. Now, the judgment is spoken about by every single Bible writer. Did you realize that the subject of the judgment is mentioned 1,000 times in the Bible? The Bible says, and can you read it with me please, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must do what, everybody? All. All is all because if all was not all, all would not be all, right? So all is what? All is all. All means everybody. For we must all do what? Appear where? Before the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Continue to read with me that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, either good or bad. So the judgment reveals that Christ has done everything possible to save us, that his grace provides ransom and pardon and deliverance, that his grace provides power. But the judgment reveals how we have chosen, prompted by the Spirit, to reveal to respond to His grace. Now, in the ancient sanctuary, there were two major services. There was the daily service. Now, in the daily service, sacrifices were offered. Blood was shed. But in that daily service, there were many things going on in the sanctuary, not just sacrifices being offered. The sanctuary is a very busy place. It was there that the priests led the congregation in singing. It was there that babies were dedicated in the court of the sanctuary. It was there in the sanctuary that offerings, thank offerings, were made. It was there in the sanctuary that people came to be taught and uh, instructed in the things of God. So during this daily service, the central part of the daily service was the offering of the sacrifice. The blood of the sacrifice was shed. The sinner confessed his sin over the head of the animal, as we've studied in previous presentations. And as he did, the priest caught the blood in the bowl and brought that blood into the sanctuary, into the holy place of the sanctuary. Previous to going in there, the priest would wash in the laver, indicating that to enter the presence of God, one must be cleansed. As you enter the tabernacle, the light of the candlestick shines there, revealing the light of the Word of God through the Holy Spirit that shines in our light. There was the table of showbread, of Christ, the very bread of life, that strengthens us every day. There was the incense revealing our prayers mingled with Christ's prayers. As the priest left the sanctuary, sin was transferred from the sinner through the lamb and its blood into the sanctuary. There were some offerings that the priest ate and brought into the sanctuary. We've studied those in previous presentations. So a stream of sin was entering the sanctuary every day in the daily service. But the question is, would the sanctuary ever be cleansed? Would the record of sin that was 
recorded through the blood of the lamb or the sacrifice is placed on the altar of incense, would that ever be cleansed? Once a year, at the end of the Jewish year, there was a call, day called the Day of Atonement. The word atonement simply means at one meant. So on the Day of Atonement, the final day of the Jewish year, a service was performed called the cleansing of the sanctuary. Just as the dying lamb represents the death of Christ on the cross, and just as the priest's ministry in the earthly sanctuary represents Christ's ministry in the holy place, so the ministry of the high priest in the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary represents this day of atonement, this day that human beings are brought at one with God, the day that the sanctuary is cleansed. How does that apply today, and what is this day of atonement? One of the Jewish sages put it this way, the day of atonement, that's the day of atonement in ancient Israel, is a day of judgment for all mankind. So the day of atonement was known as the day of judgment. All of Israel gathered around the sanctuary. They stopped whatever they're doing. We're going to study that later tonight. They gathered around that sanctuary because the day of judgment was upon them. Anybody that did not gather around the sanctuary in the day of judgment would be cut off or lost from the people. The culmination, the crowning point of the sanctuary services came in the month of October. It was the great day of atonement, or in Hebrew called Yom Kippur. Every feast of the sanctuary year in Israel, every feast pointed forward to this day of atonement. It was the most serious day in all of the year. Now, there were seven great feasts, four spring feasts and three fall feasts. First, there was the feast of Passover. When Paul speaks of Passover, he says, Christ, our Passover, died for us. So Jesus is that great Passover lamb. That was followed the next day by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven was a sign of sin. So unleavened bread and that feast represented the day after Passover that Christ, the bread of life, the one sacrificed on Calvary's cross, will remove from us the guilt of sin, the shame of sin, the power of sin. The next feast was the wave sheaf, followed immediately after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was there that Israel came on the Feast of the Wave Sheaf, waved the first fruits of their harvest. Christ, resurrected from the dead, is the first fruits of those that will be resurrected from the dead. The Bible says when Jesus comes again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, because he was the first fruits of those that died and was resurrected from the dead. So our loved ones can rise up out of the grave, and we which are alive shall be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. Death has lost its hold upon us. The death is not a long night. It is not an end without any mourning. But Jesus Christ conquered the tomb. Jesus went in and came out. So death cannot hold us. Death cannot keep us captive anymore. Death cannot shackle us anymore because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And so that loved one that died, you can see them again. If they went into the grave knowing Christ, you can put your arms around them again, that father, that mother, that sister, that brother, that grandfather, that friend. You know, for many, many years, I, lived in, I worked in the former Soviet Union, started traveling to Eastern Europe in the early 1980s. And from 1985 to 1990, I was responsible for three countries, Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, three of my responsibilities. And I traveled negotiating with communist governments very often for religious freedom. When the Berlin Wall fell, I was actually preaching in Hungary to thousands every night and then immediately went into Russia and began working in Russia in 90, 91, 91, 92, 93, and onward and have continued to travel there. But I can so recall, I remember on one occasion, the Christian church in Russia came to me and they said, look, 
there has been a bill that has been passed in Parliament to restrict religious freedom. Would you argue with one of the great uh, politicians in, in Russia? And would you argue for religious freedom? And I said, I don't want to do that. But the Baptists came, and the Pentecostals came, and the Adventists came. And they said, look, would you appear on national television? So I will never forget that night. I went on national television, and I had a debate with the leading philosopher and politician over religious freedom. And one of the things that I always sense to atheists is this. I said, what is your hope? Is this life all that there is? Is there nothing more after this life? For you, what is death? Is it a dark hole in the ground? It is a long night without a morning. For you, what is death? How do you counsel a, a, your young friend whose wife has just been killed in a car accident? What do you say? Too bad, buddy, she died? As a Christian, based on the Word of God, we believe that Christ died and he went into the tomb and he broke the bonds of the tomb and the shackles of death are over and that Jesus Christ is alive. He is resurrected from the dead. Atheism has no answer for that. But Jesus Christ has an answer to the riddle that has plagued philosophers down through the ages. The answer to death is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, the feast of the wave sheaf was the celebration of the first fruits, Christ's resurrection. Fifty days later, Pentecost was the feast of weeks where the Holy Spirit was poured out and the gospel went to the world. So here are the spring feasts that take place at the beginning of the gospel dispensation. The first century Christianity, the death of Christ on the cross is central. Jesus died so the guilt of sin would be removed, so the power of sin would be removed. Jesus was resurrected from the dead, indicating that the grave's power over us is broken, and the Spirit of God was poured out on Pentecost, indicating the gospel would go to the world, Passover, unleavened bread, wave sheaf, weeks, the spring feasts. They apply to the first coming of Christ. But the last three feasts apply to the second coming of Christ. The Feast of Trumpets. Trumpets were blown 10 days before the Day of Atonement to prepare people for the final judgment. The Day of Atonement was the judgment hour. The Feast of Tabernacles, what was that to ancient Israel? The Feast of Tabernacles is when they lived in booths celebrating their desire to live in the promised land. So, how do we see this in the Christian dispensation? The Feast of Trumpets, a message goes to the world to prepare people for the coming of Christ, the judgment hour. The Day of Atonement, the judgment hour. And then the tabernacle, the day that we'll rejoice with Christ in heaven forever. Now let's look at those three feasts. Ten days before Yom Kippur in ancient Israel, the priests blew the warning trumpets, telling everybody to get ready for the coming Day of Atonement. Now on the Day of Atonement, according to Leviticus 16 verse 4, it talks about the priest. Now, the priest on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, took off his royal garb. He did not wear that going into the most holy place. It says in Leviticus 16, 4, he shall put the holy linen tunic and linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with linen sash and with the linen turban he shall be attired. Why? Because the priest could not appear before the Shekinah glory of God with his own righteousness. He must appear before God clothed in the representation of the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, and we are all like an unclean thing in all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. So whatever we have to offer up to God, it's not good enough. Whatever righteousness we have is not sufficient enough. God requires absolute perfection. And Jesus' life in overcoming sin was absolutely perfect. So the white linen that clothed the high priest represents the exact perfect righteousness of Jesus. All of our righteousness is in Jesus. We can come before the throne of God in Jesus. We stand before the judgment in Jesus, clothed and perfected in His righteousness, not our own. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, verse 24, 
Christ has not entered into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Jesus does not dwell in an earthly temple. He died, was resurrected, and dwells in heaven above for us. Jesus tonight stands in the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary before the judgment bar of God for you. Your name is on his lips. You are on his heart. He has done everything he can possibly do to save you. And when your name comes up before the judgment bar of God, Jesus steps forth and he says, this man, this woman is one of mine. Jesus says, my death was for them. In Leviticus chapter 60, and it continues to tell the mystery, the saga of this priest. Before the priest would ever enter the sanctuary, the priest must offer sacrifice for himself and for his family. Now, when the priest offers that sacrifice for himself and for his family, it is the acknowledgement that he can only enter into the sanctuary through the blood of Christ, no other way. Now, when he's ready to enter into the sanctuary, on the Day of Atonement, the last day of the Jewish year, this Day of Judgment, there are two goats, and lots were cast. One goat was chosen as the Lord's goat, and the other goat was chosen as the scapegoat or Azazel. The Lord's goat was slain. No sin was offered, no sin was confessed over the head of the Lord's goat. The Lord's goat is slain. The pure blood of that goat is brought into the sanctuary. Why? Because all year a stream of sin had been going into the sanctuary. But this is the day of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the day that sin will be removed from the sanctuary, so there's not sin-laden blood going in. There is no sin confessed over the head of this goat because of the symbolism, the pure blood goes in. Now, one of the key concepts of the sanctuary is that guilt and condemnation of sin and its penalty can be transferred from the repentant sinner to the sacrifice and then through the blood into the sanctuary. When we come to the sanctuary, burdened with shame, burdened with guilt, we come weighted down. We confess our sin over the head of our lamb, Jesus. The, Jesus takes ownership of that guilt and shame. We, with the, a knife in our hand and imagination, slay the lamb. The blood spurts in our imagination on our legs. We see that our sin has cost God something. It's brought pain to God. The priest catches that blood in the sanctuary, brings it into the sanctuary, and the record of our sin is recorded on the horns of the altar of the sanctuary. It's recorded there. But when will the sanctuary in heaven ever be cleansed? When will sin ever be gone forever? When will the record of that sin be expunged? Sin has been transferred from the sinner through the sacrifice into the sanctuary. But then, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest comes into the most holy place of the sanctuary. He's clothed in linen, the righteousness of Christ. If he would come before God with his own righteousness, he would be instantly slain by the brightness of Christ's glory. He comes here to the Ark of the Covenant. There are two angels that are beaten out and embossed in gold, representing the interest that all thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of heavenly beings have in the, in the activities of heaven between those two cherubims are the, is the Shekinah glory of God. But there in that Ark of the Covenant it is the Ten Commandment Law, the Ten Commandment Law that is the very foundation of the government of God, that law that Adam and Eve broke in the Garden of Eden, that law that every human being has ever broken. You know, sometimes people say to me, well, the law of God was done away with. If the law of God was done away with, Jesus would not have had to die because he died because we broke the law. The law of God is enshrined. It is tabernacled there beneath 
the very throne of God in the sanctuary. And the priest comes and sprinkles the pure blood above the broken law. Thank God that the blood of Christ can be sprinkled over our transgressions, that the blood of Christ can be sprinkled over our sins. Thank God in the judgment hour, there is our high priest sprinkling in symbol his blood over the law that we have broken so that we can go free. And as our names come up in judgment, Jesus says, this man, this woman is one of mine. My blood covers their sin and pardons their sin. But notice, this is not sin-laden blood now that is sprinkled. It is pure blood. When we confess our sins, they're covered by the blood of Christ. But one day, heaven itself must be cleansed. One day, the record of those sins must be blotted out forever. So that leads us to understand the difference between the, the covering of sin and the blotting out of sin. When we confess our sins, they are covered by the blood of Jesus. But yet the record of that sin remains in heaven until the day that Christ finally blots sin out of the universe. So day by day we seek him and we say, Jesus, I long for you not only to blot sin out of the record in heaven, but Jesus, my longing is to blot for you to blot sin out of the temple of, in my heart. Lord, blot sin out of my life. Lord Jesus, by your grace, blot out that evil temper, blot out that lust, blot out that anger, blot out that resentment. Jesus, I have confessed it. Jesus, I want it blotted out of my life. Now notice, some people say, well, what could there be in heaven that uh, could ever need to be cleansed? The Bible is very clear. It talks about the sanctuary in Hebrews 9, verse 22 and 23. It says, apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It was needful, therefore, that the copies of the things in heaven should be cleansed in this way. Now, notice the expression, it was needful. That means it has to be done. But that heavenly things themselves should be cleansed with more costly sacrifices. Is there anything up in heaven that needs to be cleansed? According to this text, there is. What is it? The stream of sin that has been transferred through the record of sin into heaven by the blood of, the, by the blood of Christ, that, that, that record still remains. And Jesus, through this ancient sanctuary service on the Day of Atonement, is revealing just how heaven is going to be cleansed through the blood of Christ. Now, how could anything in heaven need cleansing? The sprinkled blood spoke of pardon, it spoke of covering. But God desires not only to cover sin, but he desires to blot it out of the universe forever. The blotting out of sin was typified by the services of the Day of Atonement, the climax in the round of ministration dealing with sin. So here you have this final end of sin. I am so glad that sin is not going to remain forever, aren't you? I'm so glad that there's a record of sin that's going to be gone forever. I'm so glad that sin will be blotted out of the universe never to raise up its ugly head again. That's why the Bible says that he not only wants to blot sin out of the heavenly sanctuary, he wants to blot sin out of the sanctuary in the temple of our hearts. Look, Acts 3, verse 19 to 21. Repent, therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. God wants to restore all things. He wants to restore his image in your life. The Bible says, 1 John 3, verse 1 and 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, yet it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You said, how can God ever do that in my life? The Bible says, Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says that he that has begun a good work in you is going to finish it. God is going to do something amazing with you. Look, when a child is in the first grade, are they in school? Are they in school? Do they know algebra, trigonometry, and calculus? I know you got smart kids. <laughs> Do they know algebra, trigonometry, and calculus? No. But if they stay in school, will they one day have a class in algebra? Yes. Look, you're in school with Jesus. Don't go out of school. As long as you stay in the school of Christ, committed to Him, He will work miracles in your life that you cannot imagine. As you come to Him every day and let the light of His Word shine in your life, as you come to Him every day and feast on the bread of life, as you come to Him, don't let the devil discourage you. Don't let the devil say to you, you're not good enough. Don't let the devil say to you, you'll never make it. Because He that has confessed, he that has pardoned your sins will give you power and strength in your life because God has spoken it by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, and I believe it, friends. What about you? Now, what's the difference between sprinkled blood in the holy place and sprinkled blood in the most holy place? The sprinkled blood in the holy place records the record of our sin. The stream of sin goes in through the lamb carried by the priest there. The sprinkled blood in the holy place is sin-tinged blood. The sprinkled blood in the most holy place is not sin-tinged blood. It's pure blood that will cleanse. The blood in the holy place represents sins covered. The blood in the most holy place represents sins blotted out. Why doesn't God blot out our sins as soon as sinners confess them? Why doesn't He just blot sin out? For two reasons. Number one, God never takes away your freedom of choice. When you come to Christ, He's going to forgive you instantly and immediately. No questions about it. But the record of that scene is up there in the sanctuary. And if you want to go looking for it, you want to go hunting it, you want to go take it back, He's not going to take that away from you. So when He blots out sin finally, it's because we have confessed that sin, we repent of that sin, and we don't want it anymore. We say, Lord, I, I want to be done with that thing. But there's a second reason why you have the blotting out of sin. And it's this. The blotting out of sin in heaven's sanctuary is so that the whole universe will be totally, absolutely clean, and there won't even be a record of sin any longer. It's going to be gone, completely gone. In those Day of Atonement services, when the priest left the sanctuary, when he came out, you remember when he went into the sanctuary, the Lord's goat was slain, but there was one other goat left. Now, the Bible says that he came out of the sanctuary now, Leviticus 16, verse 21, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat. Now, remember, when you lay your hands on the animal, what are you doing? You're not only confessing, but you're transferring what? Ownership. So here, Aaron comes out of the most holy place. He carries with him out all the sin that has been accumulating through the record of sin in the sanctuary. He lays both of his hands on the head of the live goat. Sin is, the guilt of sin is transferred. He confesses, now notice what he confesses, over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions. This is not a goat that is a savior. The savior's pure blood has cleansed the sanctuary. But here, all of the guilt of sin, all of the shame of sin, all of the condemnation of sin, all of the failures, all of the rebellion, all of that now is placed on the head of this goat. It says, in all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and he shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. So this goat is taken away, this goat that now bears the responsibility. Here, this goat is called Azazel. It represents Satan. So at the end of time, Christ leaves heaven's sanctuary, and Satan bears all the responsibility, all the guilt, all the shame of sin. He is led far away and eventually burned and consumed in the lake of fire and the universe is clean and we rejoice with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever through the ceaseless ages of all eternity. What do you say? Amen. Praise God. 
that one day the devil that's tempted us, one day that the devil that has led us into sin, one day the devil that has tried to trip you up, one day he bears the responsibility, he bears the guilt, he bears the condemnation, he's led away forever and ever. Now there in that judgment previous to that final day, Somebody is thinking here, but, but pastor, what if I don't pass the judgment? I want you to take you up into the courtroom of heaven. I want you to look up there at thousands and thousands of heavenly beings. The cherubims are there. The seraphims are there. Angels are there. They crowd in around the throne of God. Daniel saw it actually in Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. Daniel says, I kept looking until the thrones were set up. This is, this is during this day of atonement. This is previous Two, the sins being put on Satan. But this is what leads up to it that's so exciting and thrilling. I kept looking until the thrones were set up. The Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father took his seat. Thousands, thousands were attending to him. Thousands of angels gather around. There's nothing more interesting, more fascinating, more captivating in the universe than this. The thousands of angels gather around. The Bible says... Myriads were standing before him. The court was set. The books were open. Here is earth's final judgment before the guilt of sin is placed upon Satan. And there, as Daniel looks up, he sees this judgment scene. A son of man enters the court. Daniel says, I beheld till the son of man came. He enters the heavenly court. And as Jesus walks into the courtroom, every voice is hushed. And Jesus walks right to the judgment bar of God. The Bible says, Daniel 7, verse 13, he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Jesus comes there before the very throne of God. Why is this son of man? Why is this our high priest? He's actually treated like a prisoner before the bar of God because he, he stands there and your name comes up in judgment. And all of the universe is hushed. You are so valuable to God that you will not, nobody will be saved or lost by the stroke of some cosmic pen. But your name comes up before God. And Jesus steps forward. And he says, Mark Finley deserves eternal death. He deserves to go into the grave and never come out. But before the universe, he says, Father, I died that death. I was judged as guilty. I was condemned for his sins. He's come to me. His sins are covered with my blood. Now, Father, by grace, blot them out of the record forever. And the whole universe begins to sing. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive riches and power and glory forever. Your name comes up. Alice, or Mary, or Sally, or John, or Peter, Harry, your name comes up before God. And you are one of his children, bought by the blood of Christ. And as your name comes up, Jesus steps forth and he says, this man, this woman is one of mine. My blood covers their sin. They came to me and confessed. And now the record of that sin is expunged, blotted out of the whole universe. Jesus was judged as a prisoner before the bar of God. He, the gospel is good news. Jesus Christ has earned the right to take our place in the judgment. If we stand in the judgment alone, there is no way we can be saved. But if we stand in the judgment with God, there is no way that we can be lost. Look, Hebrews 9, verse 28. Can you read it with me, please? Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Notice what the text says, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, that's on the cross, and unto them that look for him he shall appear the second time without sin. What does it mean that Jesus will appear the second time without sin? He comes this time not as a sin bearer. 
He comes this time not to bear our sin, but to deliver us from this world of sin and ultimately place the responsibility all on Satan. Notice Hebrews 9, verse 26. He has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The sacrifice of Christ on Calvary's cross is not cheap grace. There are many Christians who believe that grace is cheap. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Our sins have cost every, heaven everything. Our sins have cost heaven the death of the Son of God. Our sins bring pain to Jesus now. Jesus is the Lamb, Hebrew, uh, Revelation 13, 8, slain from the foundation of the world. So from the first inkling of sin, pain entered into the universe and into, he into heaven. And the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that sin from its very inception is brought to the heart of God. Every deed of sin, every departure from right brings grief to him. He comes, he has come to put away sin, not simply to pardon our sin, but to deliver us from the grip of sin. Grace delivers us from the guilt of sin and the grip of sin. Grace delivers us and pardons us from the penalty of a broken law, but it empowers us to be different people. We come to Christ just as we are, and he says, I accept you, my child, just as you are. But as we come as we are, we don't stay as we are. There's power in the gospel to change us. In ancient Israel, all eyes were on the sanctuary during that Day of Atonement. What was going on then? Leviticus 23, verse 27 to 29, it says, It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. During these ten days before the final judgment, what was happening? They afflicted their souls. You shall do no work on that same day. In other words, it was a special time for it is the day of atonement for you before the Lord your God. For ten days Israel gathered. Any person who's not afflicted of soul, what is afflicted of soul? It means to repent of sin. It means to confess your sin. On that same day he'll be cut off. In other words, those that did not confess their sin on the day of atonement, the day of judgment, would be judged and cut off from God's people during that time. The day of atonement ceremony was like an audit, not to find out if anybody had sinned, that part was not in doubt, but to show who had taken advantage of the promise of forgiveness. So, in heaven's final judgment, before the throne of God, Jesus can only represent those who've come to him. He can only stand for those that have given their lives to him. In that judgment, the judgment reveals those who have taken advantage of the promise of Forgiveness. What is this affliction of the soul that God leads us to do now? It's a process where God invites us to our knees, where we say, Jesus, all I want is what you want. Jesus, take out of my heart anything that's not in harmony with your will. These 10 days of preparation before the Day of Atonement, before the judgment in Israel, were days of settling accounts. If anybody had an account that they owed, they would settle it asking forgiveness from God and, and from others that we had, they had wronged, putting all things in order. That was the day of judgment. Sin is not just a list of bad things we've done. It's a condition that permeates our heart. So every day we come and say, God, clothe me with your righteousness. Every day we come and we say, Jesus, deliver me by your grace. Jesus, pardon me. The affliction of soul was an attitude of contrition, clinging to the mercy of God after making a sincere and earnest effort to make things right. In your life, are there any hidden sins? Are there things deep down there inside? Anybody that didn't come and participate in this work of grace were cut off. The Bible says they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. Who's going to be approved in the judgment on that great final day? Could it be that we are living in the judgment hour right now? 
Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's happening right now. Fear God, the Bible says, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. When Christ comes to give out the rewards, there must be a judgment previous to His coming to determine who receives what reward. Are we living in the judgment hour right now? How can I possibly stand before the throne of God? I can only stand before the throne of God in Christ. The investigative phase of the judgment takes place before Jesus comes back. This sometimes is called the pre-advent judgment, a judgment that takes place before Jesus comes. But Jesus will stand for us in that judgment. Have I placed my absolute trust in Jesus as my sacrifice, as my only hope? Tonight, Jesus for you has paid it all. But the only sin he can forgive is the one you give to him. The only sin that he can pardon is the one that you confess. Jesus has paid it all. All to him I owe. When sin has left its crimson stain, Jesus washed it white as snow. When your name comes up before the judgment bar of God, there is no way you can be lost in Christ. His righteousness is sufficient. His grace is sufficient, and His power is sufficient to blot the deepest stains of sin out of your life right now. Many years ago, a young boy crossing the street was in a terrible accident, and this young lad lay by the side of the road. Ambulances were called. Medical personnel came. The boy was rushed to the hospital. And the medical personnel and physicians recognized that this boy needed a very serious operation. They operated. But as happens, as happens in many operations, the boy needed a blood transfusion. They looked for someone to donate blood. Finally, they found a blood donor. His dad had the same blood type. And the father went into the operating recovery room. It was before the days of blood plasma. It was the days that they did direct blood transfusions. The nurse took that swab and dipped it in the alcohol and rubbed father's vein and pricked him. And blood began to flow through that plastic tube directly into the boy. And the father stood there looking at the form of his son lying there, watching the blood flow into his son. And the father said, Doctor, if you need to, take it all. Doctor, if you need to, take every drop of my blood. Jesus came into a sinful world and hung on Calvary's cross. And with blood running down his hands, Dripping on the rock below is as if Jesus looked up and said, Father, take every drop of my blood because my people are too precious to be lost. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Tonight as we bow our heads to pray, would you like to, in the quietness of this moment, wherever you are, God is touching your heart. You're watching on Facebook, but God is speaking to you. Why not open your heart to Jesus right now? Why not say, Jesus, my life is yours. Jesus, I'm confessing my sin to you now. Jesus, I'm coming to you now. 
Jesus says, him that cometh to me, I'll never cast out. But you say, I've come. I've come before. But what is it in your life? What's deep down inside? He wants not only to confess you to confess your sins, he wants not only to cover them, but he wants to do a work in your heart to blot them out. Would you let him do that right now? Would you ask him for grace for pardon and grace for deliverance? As we pray right now, wherever you are, his arms are wide open for you. He says, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden, I'll give you a rest. Let's pray. Oh, my Father, we come to you just now. We open our heart to you just now. You gave every drop of blood for us. And Father, thank you for covering our sin. Thank you that it's covered from the universe as far as the east is from the west. You've separated our sins from us. The record of our sin is there covered by the blood of Christ in the sanctuary. But Father, thank you for the teaching of the day of atonement that one day sin will be blotted out. One day sin will be gone forever. Lord, blot sin out of the universe soon. Come soon, Lord, but blot it out of our hearts, Lord. And may we stand with you one day in glory and rejoice in a world where there's no sickness, suffering, or pain. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.